good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending when you are on this beautiful land that is our uh, Mother Earth. Welcome to our Sustainable Nutrition Platform uh, Roundtable. And in a few minutes, as soon as we have everybody online, we will start. Let's say one minute, one minute and a half, we start. And I have already our nice and beautiful guests here ready to conversate and debate uh, with you. I see many of you are joining. This is great again. Last time we got more than 100 people uh, joining from all around the world. So again, a pleasure to have you guys uh, connected. And I understand it's also in some parts of the world, uh, there's the Ramadan and you guys are very much uh, busy with your families and spending some time together. In other parts of the world, it's still early in the morning, but I can see particularly from Central and South America that some friends are already uh, already connected and also people from Europe. One of the complaints I usually get is we usually do our roundtables in a very good time for Europeans, not so good for East Asia and not so good for Asia for Central American and Americas in general. But you know, Europeans sometimes are very selfish. <laughs> so we made even the regulation on the time of our roundtables. Uh, but we'll try to change in the future and maybe we did actually once last time we got a, a, a round table directly from Jakarta and so we were up um, very late uh, to run it so I appreciate very much your effort okay it's three o'clock 302 so I think we can start we have several people who have joined let's see if more uh, will be joining uh, together with me today, I have three distinguished and prominent guests. Uh, two of them were, have already been uh, with me in the past, but let me welcome together with you and uh, virtually a little close to them. We have Diono Albar uh, Buran, that is uh, from Apacasindo, that is the Indonesian Association of Small Older. Then I have one of very good friend uh, that is... Uh, 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 Gert van der Biel, who is the Senior EU Policy Advisor for uh, Solidaridad. And then I have Unitan, uh, you are Unitan or Uni, as you want to call him, that is the founder and CEO of the uh, Bees. What's the topic of the day? Is small orders as pivotal player and is exporting the challenges and the needs exploring the challenges and the needs for uh, the success of the EUDR. And when we talk about the EUDR, is the European Union deforestation regulation or zero deforestation regulation. And the question that we want to ask today is very simple, is can small holders comply with such a stringent on sustainability and traceability uh, 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 regulation. And the question is very important because if smallholders can help and can comply with regulation, we will certainly succeed in reducing deforestation and the regulation will effectively work. But if smallholders or a majority of them or even a minority of them fails to comply with the regulation, well, then the regulation will be partly a failure. And moreover, the deforestation uh, reduction will be a dream or an utopia. And therefore, the message we want to send today is that without the engagement and the support to the small holders, there are high chances that the regulation will not, uh, will not work. Now, who are the small holders? This is a question that, of course, we'll try to answer today, but we're talking about small farmers around the world working in different supply chains. Today, we will focus, as we did in the past, on the commodity of palm oil. They are heavily contributing to the production of commodities. And some of these commodities are entering uh, the uh, European Union. Usually, small holders is a family-owned business or a small producer that own less than 40 hectares. For instance, this is for Malaysia. My, uh, less than 25 hectares in Indonesia, less than a certain number of hectares in other parts of the world. And some of these small holders may be part 
of a very well structured supply chain. These are the so called scheme smallholders. So, smallholders that are associated with some kind of program or company programs, and therefore they receive some sort of support in terms of technology, in terms of management, and they are part of this more structured supply chain. But at the same time, we have also independent smallholders. So, smallholders that are working on their self and they are selling their product to agents or sub agents and so no, not directly to the mills not directly to traders or refiners or companies and these small holders obviously have less access to capital they have less access or to make investment they have less access to management and practice and to uh, technology and they work in a very different way than other small holders and we understand that making the regulation work and therefore making the small holders complying, complying with the regulation takes a big effort. And you know this is something that I teach usually to my students. The world of business is beautiful because the supply chains are very different from country to country, region to region, commodity to commodity. And so if we take the case of Indonesia and we have Giono here today to explain this to us, the structure of the supply chain is very articulated. And before, between the mill and the small holder, there are many intermediaries. And the question is, how can we make this small holders complying when the regulation that comes from Europe is so far away and when there are so many people be between them and the European Union that pretends them to be compliant with the new regulation, particularly when we think about some article of the regulation, maybe Gert, you can provide some examples or some knowledge on this. Article 3, for instance, that is very specific on the requirements that the smallholders have to comply with. And we have particularly uh, the various, uh, the, the, the satellite technology or the capacity to demonstrate that the full supply chain, is it can be traceable to the final plot. Is that possible? Is that something that smallholders can do? And here we have, you are today with us, Uniten, explaining us how technology could eventually help, you know, the entire supply chain and particularly smallholders to be compliant and to demonstrate that their land is legal and to demonstrate that in their land, there is basically no deforestation and demonstrate actually where their land is. Because in many cases, it's hard to identify where the land is. For the European Union, technology is a necessary tool and is a sufficient tool, but we will see perhaps today that this, this is not the case. So it's a big challenge, but if we want the UR, uh, the UDR regulation, and if we want to participate in reducing deforestation, we need absolutely to engage small holders. And the message that we want to send today to the European Union is, Great, great job, congratulations for what you have done. But now that we are in the phase of implementing this regulation, we definitely need to take uh, uh, awareness, to take control of the things that might be not working, of the possible challenges. And the supply chain, the, the, the small holders are part of these challenges and they need to be engaged and they need to be supported. So today we will try to identify some of the needs and some of the challenges and we'll make sure to convey these challenges to uh, the European Commission, the European Parliament, all the players in the European Union. Still, it's, we are in an early stage of the regulation. We need to figure out how it will be implemented in the various producing countries, and the countries that are producing these commodities that are entering Europe. But there is still some unclarity, or I would say confusion, on how the regulation will also work inside each of the 27 countries. And we're here to help. We're here to gather your concerns, your stimulus, and try to bring them and convey them to the European Commission. But let's start. Uh, before that, just uh, uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping, as we say, uh, rules. You have a question and answer on your, uh, uh, that you can use to post your uh, questions. Uh, otherwise, there is also our website where you will see the full recording of the event and a, sh a short summary and the video clips. 
And then for transparency, please uh, visit our website to visit our to read our code of conduct and to read our uh, transparency uh, act and also our diversity and inclusion um, manifesto. Now let's start, Gert. I'm I'm very excited to hear Solidarity is very much involved for the past years with the smallholders all around the world, particularly in Southeast Asia and in Central America. Now, Gert, can you tell us looking at this? Great job of the uh, uh, regulation, great job, but still big challenge. What is the impact on smallholders and what are the main concerns that you see with this new regulation? Uh, thank you, uh, Pietro. Well, uh, as you said before, this is also an easy question, but the answer uh, is not that easy. Um, and um, Maybe first say a few words about Solidaridad. So we are an international organization uh, working uh, on the ground in around 40 countries in most of the sectors that are involved in the uh, EU deforestation regulation. So including coffee, cocoa, uh, but also soy, beef, uh, leather, uh, and also palm oil. Uh, and in palm oil, we work in, in, uh, in Latin America, uh, West Africa, and Southeast Asia. And well, if you look overall at the, 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 the regulation, um, I think it's first of all important to realize that palm oil has a bit of a specific uh, uh, difference from the other sectors. If you look at the different sectors in cocoa and coffee, uh, and also in rubber, smallholders are predominant and, and produce something like 70 and in, in rubber, even 90% of all production. On the other end, you have soy and, and beef, where the larger producers are uh, producing most of uh, the, the soy and, and beef around the world, and certainly in those regions that export to Europe. Palm oil has a mixed structure. In palm oil, around 40% of all production comes from smallholders uh, and 60% and comes from larger plantations. And if you then zoom into what the likely consequences are, uh, well, first of all, it's important to realize that the requirements that are there are requirements for companies that bring the palm oil products or derivatives, eh? it, it includes both, on the European market. So the requirements are for the companies. But in the end, companies will buy their produce and will want to know that the products that they buy are compliant with the requirements. So they will translate their, uh, the requirements to their suppliers. And for smallholders, in overall, there are two main risks. One is that um, the costs of compliance will be translated into uh, uh, cost for smallholders or that their buyers will not pay for what is needed for smallholders to comply. But a second, and I think even larger risk, is that smallholders will lose markets or that there will be incentives for buyers not to buy from smallholders, but, but from the better organized larger producers. So overall, those are the two main risks. And if you look at the different requirements, you already mentioned Article 3 that says that um, producers or, or companies that put products on the market will need to provide geolocations and will need to uh, trace the product. And secondly, that they will need to show that the products are deforestation free and produced according to the relevant legislation in the country. I think overall, for most of the smallholders, the traceability issue will be the most difficult one, because in a lot of regions, and that's not only for palm oil, but also for other products, um, uh, certainly the independent smallholders sell to agents, and then uh, or first to sub-agents, and then to agents, and then to other agents, and it will be very difficult in a lot of situations for the mills that in the end buy the, uh, the, the palm oil product, or uh, uh, the same will be true in coffee, to exactly know where it comes from. 
and and if the mills don't have the information or if the buyers that uh, put the market in Europe don't have the information, it will be difficult for them to to buy. So they will then need to invest in traceability and they will need to make sure that they can have the information or that the smallholders are organized enough to provide the information. And in situations as, as is the case in a lot of uh, South uh, countries and certainly also in Indonesia, Malaysia, a lot of the trade is informal uh, and, and, and mixing products from different uh, uh, origins and it will be difficult to trace that. And I think that is the main risk that may exclude smallholders from the market. Thank you so much, Garrett, for uh, for this uh, perspective that you you have presented, and you said something very important: the the risk of excluding smallholders from the market. That the inclusion of smallholders to the market has been of creating prosperity, creating jobs, improving the life conditions, improving education, giving a lot of opportunity. We know at competitor, we know the story uh, very well, and how the supply chains the global supply chains have created jobs and have improved the uh, prosperity of the different countries and particularly of uh, the uh, these are more disadvantaged people. And in this case, the palm oil supply chain is a, is a great example. Uh, you sort of somehow outlined some of these uh, challenges, but one question, very quick question that I have for you, given the complexity that we understand, and I tried to describe as well without going too much into details, but it seems that when the UDR was designed, there was little understanding of the complexity of some of these supply chains, particularly the palm oil supply chain, and the fact that the small holder, that is the one actually producing the raw material, is just the, the beginning, or I would say the last part upstream, of an infinite number of players and intermediaries. And in some cases, given also the geography of the countries, given also the high number of population of the country, it's very hard to understand who is doing what, particularly when we are in front of an informal economy and when some of the payments are cash or the relationship is not based on contracts, but is based on trust and trust is at the core of, uh, of business. So do you think there was the kind of luck and uh, I would say a bad word, a strong word, like ignorance of how some supply chain work? Well, first thing I want to say is that the regulation is very much based on the premise that if you ensure that the supply chain is free of deforestation, that this will actually reduce deforestation on the ground. So the focus in the, in the, uh, in the legislation is very much on ensuring there is no deforestation in the supply chain, which has a, a value as such, but is only a part of the puzzle of reducing deforestation. And, um, and as you say, indeed, supply chains in palm oil, but also in a lot of other products are complex. And, and certainly in palm oil, where Europe has only 10% of the export markets uh, in, in Indonesia uh, and, and Malaysia, you can have a deforestation-free supply chain with a small number of, uh, of suppliers. But the real challenge, and, and I think that's also where uh, the complexity of, of inclusion of smallholders comes, comes in, the real challenge is to make sure that you have impact on the ground and that requires more than just ensuring that your supply chain is deforestation free but that requires uh, collaboration with smallholders with stakeholders that requires a good partnership with uh, uh, private and public stakeholders in in producing countries and that is something that uh, the European Union has hardly worked on so far. And I think that is really needed to make the deforestation regulation successful to, uh, uh, and, and to make it uh, something that really has a positive impact, both on reducing deforestation, where smallholders are key, 
but also having a positive impact uh, on livelihoods of, of people um, and, uh, and to combine social and environmental positive impact. Thank you, Gert, uh, particularly for mentioning also now the, the key role of small orders. And I think, and I want to share this, that small orders want to comply with the regulation also because there are high chances that this regulation will become a benchmark for, for other countries that will eventually follow. So it's in the interest of small holders to comply. But as we said, there, the risk is that there are high costs that cannot be absorbed by small holders. And some, maybe somebody else alongside the supply chain doesn't want to take or they will not fall on the consumer. So where the, the high cost is falling, it's a, it's a obviously big question that need to be addressed. But I, I think I have the privilege here to have a small holder, or at least a representative of the small holder, and particularly of Apcasindo, that is Diono. Now, Diono, starting from the premise that you want to comply with the regulation, the question is, can you and the small holders, particularly the one of Indonesia that you represent, but I can extend the question to, uh, to the rest of the world, can they comply? Can you comply with the regulation? as it okay. is right now. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Petro, for the time. Yes, as been mentioned by Gerd, it's a very easy question, but it's very hard to answer. So let me uh, share my screen. Give me one moment. Okay. Yes. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce myself. My name is General Barburhan. I'm from... Uh, Apkasindo, Indonesia Oil Palm Smallholders Association. And the topic today is smallholders as a pivotal player. Since we have two rounds, so I will separate the topics into two. The first one is now, is that the eye opening perspective of smallholders and challenges of the EU DR. Okay, a little bit of uh, demographic information of uh, Apkasindo. Apkasindo represents all pound smallholders across Indonesia from Sabang Island, from Sumatra Island to Papua Island in 22 provinces where smallholder, well, the palm oil exists. And in Indonesia, this is the demography of the ownership of the land. Uh, in total, there are 16.38 million hectares. Smallholders are the second biggest player, 6.72 million hectares all around Indonesia. So smallholders is not a small player, it's quite a big player in Indonesia. So millions of people rely on uh, this crop. There are 2.6 million smallholders, 4.2 million direct workers, 12 million indirect workers. So in total, uh, more or less 18 million people rely on palm oil, not including the user or the, uh, the one people who use palm oil daily and is contributing to 3.5% to Indonesia's GDP. Uh, back to the question of uh, Prof. Pietro asking before, what are the challenges of the palm oil smallholders to comply to this EUTR? Uh, let me discuss first, what, is the where are, what are the benefits of uh, oil palm for the smallholders, for the people who rely on palm oil? First one is that agricultural sector development. It is true that people who uh, develop or for uh, people who grow their palm oil tree, indeed, agricultural, sec agricultural sector development is there. And then education improvement because of it is related to the creating job opportunities because people uh, as the smallholders who plan that palm oil and then their uh, harvest their crop, they have the money, they have the income from the oil palm crop. And it creates job opportunity, not only to the owner, not to the smallholders, but for the people around the crop. So maybe I can ask my siblings to help me. I can help my, I can ask my family to help me. So it creating job opportunities for us as a society. And then emerging new economic hub in rural areas. Because we believe, especially in Indonesia, the economy starts from the rural areas and palm oil is one of the solutions that could improve the economy of the people in rural. Second, then the, the, fourth, the fifth one is that more affordable daily needs. 
And then, of course, in Indonesia, used to, in 90s, uh, 1990s, 1980s, 1970s, there are deforestation. And we believe that uh, today the deforestation in Indonesia is going lower and lower since there, there is the moratorium of the oil palm. And this palm oil, for, pe for the land that is degraded, so people come to that land, they, they, they buy the land, and then they have the land ownership, and then they plant the trees, there's a palm oil trees, and then they have the money. So it could also have deforestation. So uh, in sum, you could say that from palm oil, we can achieve sustainable development goals. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, affordable and clean energy, because we have biodiesel from palm oil, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation, infrastructure, climate action, and life on land. So for those who say that uh, palm oil is not beneficial for the people, especially for smallholders, no, it's quite the opposite. Smallholders reap the benefit of having, of having the uh, palm oil crop. And this could be one of the solution. Now, we just mentioned about the challenge. Now we're talking about one of the solutions is that in Indonesia, palm oil is one, the one and only crop, vegetable oil crop that has the certification, sustainable certification. In Indonesia, locally, we call it ISPO, Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil Certification. It is mandatory for private and government However, it's still voluntary for smallholders, consisting of 10 criteria and 33 indicators. It's for smallholders. It encompasses legals, GAP, good agricultural practices, management of biodiversity, transparency, and sustainability. So from this ISPO, it could be one of the solutions that I will elaborate later in the second round. ISPO actually assisting oil palm smallholders to achieve intensification and implementing gaps, improving supply chain traceability of Indonesia palm oil, so may improve credibility from international market. So if we relate it to the EUDR, ISPO, we believe that is one of the solution to match between this EUDR and ISPO, if this EUDR takes place. And then increasing FFB, Fred first bunch, uh, production of oil palm smallholders, which thus may add up the income of the smallholders. Last slide is that this is the uh, supporting slide that I just mentioned before that palm oil is the only vegetable oil crop that has sustainable certification. As we see here, it's from RSPO and USDA says that palm oil, it already has sustainable certified palm kernel, and the other vegetable oil crop still doesn't have the sustainable certification. And well, we can see on the left side is that World Deforestation Index Vegetable Oil Per Ton. We could see here that palm oil is the very low, which means it less land needed and more oil produced. So it also confuses for us as smallholders, how come palm oil as this efficient, as this productive, could be in the high risk, uh, high risk category in EUDR. And also we see down below is that the species richness loss index of palm oil and other, other vegetable oil. We can see that palm oil is the lowest one. It's from Bayer and Bayer Red, Red Matcha. Highest and widest canopy cover crop because uh, palm oil can going to the top up until two meters, three meters. And it only requires to, for replanting for every 35 years. It's not, it's not yearly crop. So yeah, this could be one of the biggest question for us as the smallholders. How come palm oil as the most productive could be included, included in the high risk uh, category? And I will elaborate it later in the second round. Back to Prof. Pietro. Yeah, thank you very much. But I want to go straight to the second round together with you right away and try to figure out 
if and whether you guys can comply with the UDR, beside the fact that you mentioned, and uh, I just want to remember, to remember, to remind all of us with an important number that was certified by uh, a Global Forest Watch. And just do an example, a, a little game, guys. Go online and try with one chat box, these AI applications, and ask question specifically about uh, uh, Indonesia and deforestation, and you will be surprised because in all the answer I got, the answer was Indonesia has for the past years, for the past five years, reduced deforestation. So even the artificial intelligence is now convinced <laughs> that Indonesia, and just this talking specifically about Indonesia, has reduced uh, deforestation for the past uh, five, uh, uh, five years. But my question specifically to you is, can you comply right now with the regulation? And if not, what do you need? Okay, so then we go straight to the second straight. round then. All straight. right, thank you. You, you, take, you took it from <laughs> far away. <laughs> We're I becoming like it. Italian. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I'll continue. Thank you. You started from very far away. <laughs> okay, so we we'll find the missing links here. All right. So that... Uh, we continue to the second round. Yeah. Can we comply? Can the smallholders comply? Uh, we start from this question, uh, from, from this uh, statements from Dr. Rydia Stutik, saying that optimization of trade consists of three aspects. First one is market access. Second one is rules and regulations. Third one is cooperating and supporting SMEs, which is smallholders in this uh, case, on economic and technical. So... Our question is that does the EU only focuses on number two, limiting trade access, and then we continue to the uh, next part. Uh, I will ask you to follow my uh, presentation step by step. <laughs> okay, so this one, this could be one of the biggest challenge. The size of the smallholders, the size of the palm oil plantation in Indonesia is so big, it's so wide, it's so large. And these are some of the supply chain for smallholders, yeah? For smallholders, in the left side is for smallholders. So smallholders going to their cooperation and then they're going to big buyer and then they're going to the mill. That's uh, the very ideal one is that smallholders, cooperation and then mill. However, most of the smallholders in Indonesia, the supply chain is on the right one. Smallholders, cooperation, cooperation sell it to the small buyer Small buyer sell it to the big buyer. Big buyer sell it to the mill. It's only a supply chain for the smallholders, ladies and gentlemen. Not until, not until to the end buyer. Not until to re retailer. And then on the right side, we continue to the trader, oil mill crash, refinery, shipping, manufacturing, and then retailer. So this could be one of the biggest challenge. How come this EUDR trace? all the supply chain from the retailer up until to the smallholder. It could be said that many people say, oh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect the smallholders. Not possible. We say that it's not possible. It has to affect the smallholders. Why? Smallholders is the, the very beginning of the supply chain. Anyone in any business, in any retail, in any industry, the very beginning of the supply chain affected the most. So we could say uh, in the EUDR graph, I read that the price of the price of uh, what is that? Uh, I'll continue later. I'll continue later. So the, the price, the price of the, for the operation for the due diligence costs around ninety thousand euros. So we don't believe that people say, oh, it won't affect the smallholders. It will only affect the companies. Does the company want to bear their own costs? No. Must be pressing to the, you know, to the supply chain before them. And up until the very end, going to the smallholders. That's one of the challenge. Second one, this is what I just mentioned before. The due diligence of operations obligations. First one is that the cost and the time. We just mentioned before the supply chain, you know, the cost, 5,000 to 90,000 euros. I got it from the EU 
uh, the EU uh, draft is as is only for establishing the due diligence system. No, we don't believe that smallholders won't be affected by this cost, even though this is one of cost. But the company, we believe, they don't want to bear the cost by themselves. So, obviously, the price of FFB will go down at least by this much, by 700,000 kilograms of FFB, if uh, we calculate it by 2,000 rupiah, this point, the price of FFB in Indonesia. Second one is that palm oil as the top productive crop assessed as the high risk. So this could be one, the biggest question from us as the smallholders. We work, we wake up in the morning, we see the palm oil crop, we, we harvest it, we sell, we sell it to the uh, corporation, corporation sell it to the small, small buyers, small buyers sell it to big, big buyers, big buyers sell it to the mill. So we do it every single day and people from the EU call it high risk. But the, the palm oil, people rely on this. It's not, it's, not, it's not big people, it's not big companies. It's people rely on this industry. So it's also related to the comprehensive versus simplified due diligence because I saw from the draft says that uh, the higher risk, the more comprehensive the due diligence will be. So is that fair for the smallholders as the, you know, the very beginning? First, is that about the cost? The price of FFB will go down. Second one is that the due diligence itself will be in comprehensive due diligence. And the third one is that it stated that sustainable certification, RSPO, ISPO, etc., MSPO, etc., only as supplementary document, the document, not substituting operator's responsibility for due diligence. So does the EUDR doesn't trust the certification uh, for RSPO, ISPO, MSPO? So what, what, what happened to the smallholders who already worked their best to get the certification, uh, the, the sustainable, sustainable certification? So this could be also the challenge. So the EU should take in place, first one is that the cost that will be bare to the smallholders, because second one is that the risk itself as the highest productive crop, how could it be in high uh, risk? Because it also will affect the motivation of the smallholders to follow this regulation. We want, it, it's very hard for us we do our best, but someone say, "Yeah, you are so bad." So that that is very explicit in that in that situation. Third one is that we work our best in in our country, especially in Indonesia, to have ISPO Indonesia Sustainable Palm Oil certification, and then it says only as supplementary document. It's not it's not as the main document. It's not a substituting, not changing the operator's responsibility for due diligence. So what's the benefit for? smallholders who already has the ISPO certification then. Because for uh, having the ISPO certification, there are a lot of steps that needs to be followed and it also incurred costs. So it's, it's, it's related to the motivation of the smallholders. So who will bear the cost? Obviously the beginning of the supply chain, the smallholders. And also related to the cutoff date, 31 December, 2020, um, we think this way, if after cutoff date found from deforested, deforested land, all produce, including ISPO certified, would be, would be perceived as palm oil from deforested area. And we believe perception creates market demand. Diminish demand, diminish millions of smallholders source of income because the price of FFB will, will go down, will, will plummet if we say it in a very explicit way. Because people doesn't believe anymore in, in, in palm oil. But we need to remember that smallholders, the millions of people rely on this crop. This is very important, ladies and gentlemen, representative of the EU. And then uh, 
us as the small holders from Indonesia last week, we just uh, sent petition to the EU embassy on 29th March 2023. Uh, the, the, the ask is that there are five points. The first one is that withdrawal of targeting EUDR against oil fund small holders and other non-EU farmers. Second one is that withdrawal of high risk level for Indonesia because it's very related to the motivation of small holders to comply to this EUDR regulation. And then third one is that respect and recognize ISPO standard because small holders, we at the back of our mind, now we are on the second generation. Me, myself, as the second generation, as the second generation, we know that sustainability is very important. Fourth one is that ensure that EU will no longer discredit from oil. The fifth one, is that a written apology? So those are the points uh, answering the question from Prof. Pietro. Uh, can smallholders comply if, if the EU, first, uh, thinking about the cost and the time. Second one, thinking about the risk, the high risk one. And the third one is, right, is that re regarding the ISPO. The EU uh, should think about the and should, should recognize his post standard. Thank you, back to Prophet. Thank you very much, Diono. You actually move uh, one, before you move one step backward, now you move one step forward, already answering my possible future question about what you want from uh, um, the EU, but I love when the conversation is, uh, is moving on its own dynamically. Uh, you mentioned at a certain point, and uh, I mentioned it as well, the issue of uh, geolocation and it brings us into, and I mentioned also chat GPT and the AI uh, apps, and we are moving into technology because technology has been for the past years in the focus of the supply chains on how they can support traceability, blockchain, the various app. And so here uh, we are probably one of the most acknowledged person when it comes to, uh, to Palm. He has already started a presentation. He doesn't want to show his face, but he said, I want to go straight to the presentation because he's a tech guy. Uh, and here with us today, we have our friend, a uni uh, or you are Uniten, who is the CEO and the founder of DBiz, that is a technology company. But uni before being a tech guy is, or a India Silicon Valley guy is moreover a great connoisseur, very knowledge, of supply chains and particularly of the palm oil supply chain. When I got conversation with him, he brought to so much knowledge to me that I was just you know overwhelmed with this knowledge and I'm so grateful and I'm so happy he's here with us now in a different capacity, uh, particularly providing technology. And my question, Uni, what is the role of technology in supporting eventually small holders and making the UDR possible? Thank you, Professor Petro. First of all, uh, a big thank you to Competir for inviting me as a fellow panelist among the two other distinguished panelists who are uh, on this webinar. So as you can see from the title of my presentation, what I'd like to explain is technology can be a great enabler. And I think we are discussing EUDR and in the context of EUDR, how do we include smallholders? If that is the context, what I'd like to take you through is, as Professor Petro mentioned, I have been in this industry 38 years. So I, I have been uh, exposed to the kind of challenges that every single node of the supply chain has, uh, faces. What we as an industry have been facing for the last 38 years in terms of, of sustainability. So let me first start by identifying what are, in my view, the challenges in smallholder inclusion for EUDR compliance. First, let us look at structural. What are structural challenges? Today, all of us know there is no visibility. To the last mile, smallholders are not visible. Their land title polygons are not available. End buyers have no visibility to them. Smallholders don't have a formal way of keeping supply chain transaction record. There is no guidance in EUDR as to how smallholders would be supported. Multinationals have their own initiatives, independent, discrete, many of them expensive, 
small efforts in small in smallholder areas, but nothing to create a meaningful impact. Government initiatives are also very discreet. Indonesian government, Malaysian government, Colombian government, Thai government, all of the palm producers have their own initiatives, but they are not aligned to what EUDR is. To me, these are all structural issues that we need to get, grapple with. Let's move forward and see what social issues. You heard 40% of the global output comes from uh, smallholders. It comprises of nearly 8 million smallholders. Uh, Yono is a second generation smallholder, but most smallholders are older generation. They're less educated. And the younger generation, many of them, not smart guys like Yono, find farming not a very attractive career. It's not easy to train these older people on sustainability requirements. Professor Petro mentioned, most smallholders are not organized. They are independent and it is so difficult. They speak different languages, live in remote corners of the world. How do you communicate with them and get them all to be convinced that you need to align to a UDR new regulation? Obviously it looks like a mammoth task. Let's move to the third challenge, economic challenges. Smallholders don't have adequate resources to be an RSPO certified. You already heard from Yono. Maybe they could be ISPO or MSPO certified. There's no mechanism to incentivize them to say, guys, be more sustainable. We are willing to give you something to be more sustainable. There's no mechanism. You saw the complexity of smallholder supply chains goes through dealers, sub-dealers, or in Indonesia, they call it cooperatives before it lands up in a mill. How do you coordinate harvesting, transport? It is such a logistical challenge. This already increases the cost to dealers and millers. And obviously, all that cost is borne by smallholders because it gets deducted from their price of the fruit. All this means downstream companies who want to source from smallholders find this to be a very onerous task. Obviously, they feel this might increase their cost substantially. And we all know because of lack of resources, smallholder yields are low. And this is the reason why the national average of countries like Indonesia and Malaysia is low because individual smallholder yields are very low. Now, all these are economical challenges that we as an industry and smallholders in particular need to grapple with. So how can technology be an enabler? Looking at all the challenges, let's look at the structural one. We believe that if you can create a digital ecosystem that captures all transactions, giving you real-time visibility to the last mile, including the last smallholder, how can you then synergize a digital transformation supply chain data with satellite imaging on a real-time basis, giving you exact GPS locations of every smallholder, every mill, every dealer, all along the supply chain, even if you don't have a polygon, can we create sophisticated satellite imaging that is able to provide deforestation around a smallholder area? If you ask me, it's perfectly possible, readily implementable. All this digital supply chain data can be immutable, stored on a blockchain, cannot be altered. This can be used to provide due diligence and sustainability authentication, exactly what EUDR is looking for. So when you want due diligence record, whenever you attempt a multiple product transformation industry like Palm, involving millions of smallholders and stakeholders, it is only technology that can cause disruption and help you reduce your cost and improve efficiency. And now, based on immutable data, you can issue digital tokens to smallholders and then incentives, which I would strongly advocate the EU to look at, that whenever a smallholder is on a supply chain and his fruit is sustainable and can be measurable, please make sure he gets something more in his pocket. And that can be done through digital tokens. And these are disruptive technologies that 
I would dare say, instead of increasing cost, it could actually reduce cost of supply chain operations. So the same happens with social. How do you get people with multiple languages? Today, there is almost 95% smartphone penetration in Southeast Asia. They are used to TikTok and you can watch videos in their own languages. These apps, you punch in three different numbers and your entire data is taken care of by the algorithm. So this is something that will appeal to a second or third generation smallholder because it is technology that is enabling him to be a part of a global supply chain. And instead of physically going down on the ground, you can now do digital training videos. Just like millions of viewers watch TikTok videos, it's easy to download in your own language. Then if you look at the most important part, and that is economic, we, our model is this entire digital transformation tool can be given free to smallholders, zero cost to smallholders. All the data analytics will help them improve yield and quality, not only for smallholders, they would get real-time market information, putting more money into their pocket. And all of our logistics algorithms will help easier coordination and reduce costs. And very contrary to common belief, technology can actually help you reduce the cost of doing business and even complying with EUDR if one adopts technology and embraces technology and that disruption when adapted can really transform our industry. And once you have immutable data of supply chain coming from smallholders, you can provide low cost working capital, you can provide agricultural supplies like fertilizers to their doorstep at a lower cost. Now this is the kind of transformation technology can do for smallholders. And I would strongly urge organizations like the EU uh, that is formulating policies like EUDR or multinationals that now you can have the ability to implement a system using technology. At the same time, you have an opportunity to improve the livelihood of millions of smallholders. And they are the backbone of this entire supply chain. So I would stop here. And I am happy to take any questions in the second round uh, as Professor Petro would like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuni, uh, for this uh, portrait that you uh, provided about the role that technology can play in enabling, particularly smallholders in tackling the problem of uh, deforestation. I took, um, I took several notes, but I have to go back to a couple of things that I was, uh, of course, I received some messages uh, one was regarding Diono. Please, Diono, there are several questions for you. Just try to see whether you can answer uh, uh, a couple of them. When Diono refers to the FFB, he was referring to fresh fruit bunch, uh, so the fruit of the uh, of the palm that is harvested by uh, the small elders. My team is pushing me to say you are horrible when it comes to social media. Well, yes, it's almost finished, but I, I have to say we were live tweeting. And so please just follow our hashtags on zero deforestation, competitor.eu, and so forth. Apologize to my team if I'm not so social. And to everybody else, there is question and answer. So we have very few minutes left. Uh, otherwise, people, I know that at the Howard, they jump off to other meetings or they have many other activities and Indonesia is very, and Malaysia is very late as well. In Central America, they have to go to work. Uh, in Europe, we're going to get our usual break and very soon our holidays. Uh, 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 Gert, I'm coming to you rapidly with a very concise answer, please, and apologize for this. What do you think the EU right now should do to support smallholders? Well, I think the, the key thing is to work together with the governments uh, uh, in Southeast Asia uh, and invest in smallholder capacity to comply with the requirements. And, and the, the technologies that Uni uh, mentions, I think, can play a very important role there. Um, and and uh, modern uh, technologies can definitely help there. But before doing that, I think it is important 
that both sides uh, end their polarization and that uh, they uh, really start working together. And that, I think, starts with acknowledging the progress that has been made in Southeast Asia in reducing deforestation uh, and also recognizing uh, the, the, the efforts done through ISPO and MSPO to really improve and to really start cooperating based on that acknowledgement. And I think that's where it starts. And then uh, together see what can be done also in the future to, uh, to uh, continue the, the, the results that have been made in reducing deforestation. And uh, uh, hopefully that would also result in, in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia being seen as, uh, as low risk. And um, because if you look at uh, the, the, the benchmarking that will be done in the coming 18 months, eh, where uh, all countries will be uh, either standard, low risk or high risk, um, it will look into uh, uh, the deforestation rate in the past. It will look into uh, uh, expansion that is taking place. If the EU and Indonesia and Malaysia could agree on also future measures to ensure that the low rate of deforestation will be continued, um, and, and, and if they then could also work together on in including smallholders uh, in the deforestation rate, I think that would be a good start for a cooperation uh, to really make sure that deforestation is actually uh, reduced and smallholders can be included. Thank you. Thank you, Gerrit, for being here with us and particularly for providing these very meaningful uh, um, statements and uh, your point of view. That is the point of view, I assume, of Solidaridad that is doing an amazing work uh, on many fields, but particularly with small older and in the palm oil. You said there is very much happening, and I think there is very much we can learn. You mentioned Indonesia, Malaysia. There's a great work, particularly you need a, a, a Guatemala is doing with uh, satellite technology. They have achieved uh, a very uh, amazing uh, results, but we can also learn or cross learn from different supply chains. If I, think, I if I think about what Coco is doing or other Coco is doing or other uh, supply chain is just amazing. And I think there should be some form of uh, integration and some form of migration of uh, technology and experience and knowledge from one supply chain to the, the other one, what we call as uh, a form of contamination. Uh, Diono, very briefly, is there anything you want to answer? I since you received several questions, some on the origin of Dayton and many more, uh, mostly to you. Is there anything you want to answer? Yeah, I'm trying to answer it due to the time. I'm trying to answer it by, by text. I'm helping you. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So <laughs> I just interrupt you for a second. You mentioned some of the things that you have asked to the European uh, to the European. Are you still there? Because I see you freezing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yes, now you're back. Is there, uh, what Gert said, is there one thing that you want from the European Union or one sort of message that you want to send straight away to the European Commission right now in the phase of implementing the regulation? Yes, one, one sentence, considering the smallholders. Because anything, any regulation should affect the smallholders. So if the smallholders are affected, then the supply chain itself of the palm oil, of the crop, of the oil itself, it will be destructed because smallholders is one of the biggest players. And those are the people. The people are very reluctant. The cost is very high and very reluctant to the people. If there's a new regulation, it's very reluctant to the people. So the EU, should consider more about the smallholders because the palm oil industry, especially in Indonesia, it many millions of people rely on it. Thank you. Back to Prof. Petro. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I apologize if there was some uh, problem with the uh, connectivity, but don't worry because the entire full recording would be online together with, uh, yeah. with a bunch of, uh, uh, of short videos, video clips, and uh, the full summary and the presentations and some of your uh, key statements. We are getting to the end. and. I got a message saying, Uni, that you are too optimistic when it comes to technology. Is your optimism justified? And what would be the obstacle from here on to, let's say, slow down or block somehow or stop 
the process of implementing this technology that can enable small holders and the food supply chain uh, to use technology to solve uh, most of the problems, uh, particularly when it goes downstream to the small older. And the, as Diono said, and, and, and Gert said too, the small older from the European perspective is far away, far away. There are so many people in between. Can we make sure that the small older will have access to the technology? You need a mic, mic. your microphone is off. Sorry, uh, my, my optimism is derived from on the ground work that we have done particularly with small holders. So we have done pilots in Colombia, we have done pilots in, in uh, Malaysia, where we have worked with smallholder ecosystems and found how easily they adapt to such digital technology, particularly when it comes to them at no cost. So that's where we derive our optimism. Where we need help uh, in terms of people embracing this is really in the outreach program. And you said it right. When you talk about between Malaysia and Indonesia, over 3 million smallholders, there needs to be funding provided either from EUDR or from the respective governments or jointly where the communication and outreach for smallholders is going to take time, is going to cost money. While the technology comes free to them, it is that process of communication and engagement. That is the area where we as a technology company think we need help and support from all stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice, so much for being here with us and for taking this new venture with your DBS uh, new company, your startup, and I wish you the greatest luck for the work that you are doing. And thank you always for sharing your knowledge. Gert, thank you again for being here with me. It's always a pleasure and it's always great to hear from you. And uh, I think we can continue to cooperate. Thank you, Diono, for the work you're doing you. and good luck with your initiative. Thank you to the many people thank that you. were here with yeah. us and most of them have stayed here for the entire uh, hour. Well, the message here is there are big challenges. You know, I would like to summarize everything, but we're really running out of time. We'll be on our website together with the video recording and the summary and on our social media as well. We will make sure that this message will be conveyed to the European institutions. And just a little rumor, EU says there will be money to support producing country. Let's see, cross your finger. That's a great news. EU promises a lot of money <laughs> lately. Not sure whether it comes or not, but let's cross our fingers. Still, let's bring our message to the uh, uh, to the European Commission, the importance of involving a small older. You said correctly, and it's part of our, our title, a pivotal uh, player. Thanks for being uh, here with us. Keep following us. We'll come back next month with the new discussion, the roundtable discussion. We haven't discussed the topic yet internally. Let me thank my team as well for the great job they have uh, they have done. So guys, let's see again very soon. Otherwise, if you are here in Europe or if you are a Christian or believer, happy Easter. If you don't, happy Ramadan or happy whatever you are going to do. Happy time. Enjoy the rest of your day, uh, night or afternoon and good luck very much.